let's start off, David. Welcome, by the way. It's great yeah. to have you in the studio. Good um, evening. What would you say? Um, just tell us about the Communications Workers Union. What it is, how big it is, how many members you got, what which sectors you're involved in. Yeah, we have membership of about 190,000 members. We mostly represent uh, postal and telecommunication workers. And um, we're a union that we always say connects the country. So, you know, we're out there in every town, city, village delivering letters. Uh, Our people in the telecommunications side manage to connect broadband all the time um, and phones and everything. So we're a strong union. We're very much based in workplaces. I think we're unusual in that way in that we really do pride ourselves on having a rep in every single workplace. You can never guarantee that that's always there. But I think more than any union in the UK, um, we still put workplace issues at the top of our agenda. And when we talk about politics, we always relate it to the industrial issues. We think that, you know, you, you should talk about politics, but you have to do that in the context of what's happening in the workplace. So, name some companies where you've got a lot of members. I mean, BT, presumably, yeah, is the BT, biggest one. Yeah, uh, BT, Royal Mail Group, uh, the two main companies. Um, we what, do what, what about the start mobile phone expand. companies? Yeah, we've got members in EE, places like that, um, in Sky. Um, we want to expand our membership in some of these companies. Um, it's always a battle to try and get into some of these companies. What, why is that? Well, because the law um, stops you getting access So, you know, you can't actually always go in and talk to people about joining a trade union. Um, As you know, you know, last 30 30 odd years, really, the Tories have spent a lot of time and energy and resources in bringing in anti-trade union laws. And what they're trying to do is crush the voice of working people, the real voice of working people. So, So how does it work? If a company decides that they don't want their employees to join a trade union, they effectively go out of their way to stop you talking to them yeah i mean they bring in uh, companies that are skilled in union busting we call it um so they will spend money on stopping unions trying to recruit people but the the most important point is well they have techniques a lot of them have come from places like america um and they will you know in, in a way that is a bit underhand often they will almost threaten workers that if you join a union um, you know, you might get a sack, but they don't do it up front because it's not legal to do that. Um, but the laws are such at the moment, you know, we have some of the worst laws in Western Europe on trade unions and people need to recognise that. Um, and they're done in a way that stops people freely having that debate. And that's probably one of the reasons why membership has declined over, you know, I'm talking about the whole movement, mm. um, along with the fact that the world of work has changed. And, you know, what we believe is that it's about to turn a tide. Uh, we see opportunities now. We see what's happening in today's world of work. And I think it's a time when, you know, unions are still powerful, still six million people, but we've got to reach out to more workers. I don't think there's any evidence out there that young workers don't want to be part of unions. I think it's something that we've also got to meet young workers halfway. That, that's an interesting point because I suspect if you are, I don't know, say you're 22 years old, you work mm. in one of the industries that, that you deal with, um, the whole concept of trade unions m- may seem to be somehow foreign in a way or, or historical because they'll think, oh, well, I, re- I remember sort of my parents, my grandparents being involved in strikes in the 70s and 80s or, or whatever. Why would I want to join a union if if that's my recollection of what what they're all about? Well, I I think what else is shows like this tonight, because also there's been a media bias against trade unions um, over many, many years where, you know, shows like Yorni and, you know, you're having me on tonight, which is good. Um, But, you know, there's a lot of people who get a voice who don't represent anybody. Um, And yet people who represent thousands and thousands of workers, even today, uh, are often denied that voice. So we've got to convince people. um, What I'm convinced about is that young people have got a conscience. Often I think they're seeing the world in the right way, more than perhaps some who have come through their working career. Mm. And I think that young people are getting engaged in politics. Jeremy Corbyn has played a massive role in that. Uh, What we've got to learn, I suppose in the same way that Jeremy talks about a new kind of politics, we do need a new kind of trade unionism. But it's fighting unions that we want. You know, there's no point in messing about 
with um, you know having a soft image of trade unionism. Um, you've got to be honest, we're there to fight for workers' terms and conditions. And the more of that, the more people will join trade unions. It is interesting what you say about young people because I, I think increasingly younger people are turned off by party politics and yeah. they, they increasingly look to maybe single-issue pressure groups to make their voices heard because mm. most people feel strongly about something or other. And I guess that's your challenge, to tap that th- th- those kind of people who do care about issues mm. but to make sure that they know that the issues that you're talking about are relevant to them yeah and to do that you've got to use the communication methods that young people use um, and if you can't do that in the communications workers <laughs> union exactly, you're, you're on to yeah. a loser well, we, aren't you? we're good at that we're good at that we've got a great communications team um i think we've led the way in that debate uh, we do events like you know we're online uh, we're live Facebook sessions where we say, you know, at five o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you can come and speak to the General Secretary of the Union. Uh, we open that up to the public. And we've had, you know, particularly when we've been in disputes, you get a, a lot of people tuning in to listen, mm. to put their views across, you know, so we're not afraid of that. Um, we think it's a great thing. Well, let's talk about some of the issues in the whole world of work that you're looking at in particular. Um, what What is the main issue that you find? I mean, let's take it for granted that one one of the things you want to do is increase the wages of all, all your members i mean that's yeah. what all trade unions want to do quite rightly um what are the other issues that you're concentrating on at the moment well i, I think you've got to put it in a in a context of saying first of all that what's happening in the world of work today and i'm really interested in listening to what your listeners have to say about that and actually i would make this plea you know let's not spend the hour talking about what might happen with brexit and the world of work let's actually talk about what's happening today in the uk because i think that will tell a story what i see is workers in every sector in almost every job uh, saying really that i'm facing questions and being being sort of faced on a, a daily grind almost of employers saying three things to them. one how can i make you work faster how can i make you work harder and how can i actually do that for less and i think what's wrong is the the whole ethos of work in this country is has failed so we've got a low skilled low wage low productivity um economy at the moment and i, I would suggest that this is the most pressurized and least rewarding working environment in my living memory and i think if you look at the the British economy at the moment, I would say the very foundation of the British economy is insecure work, is uh, in-work poverty and austerity. And that's failed, and therefore it's about changing the whole ethos of work. Let's reinvent work. Let's make it, you know, where instead of paying CEOs, for example, to break things up and smash things up, which they seem to get a lot of money for doing, that we actually pay workers again to create things and you know really change the whole world of work so you know we're we're looking at a radical change on a range of issues uh, pays one of them the hours of work is another the contractual status of employees is crucial in this debate you know the gig economy uh, it ain't going to get any better is it as we move forward into the gig economy ai artificial intelligence digitalization it's going to get worse unless workers come together and what we're up for is doing something about it. And we want to reach out to organisations. We want to reach out to workers who are not members of trade unions. And we want to say to them, come and join a union. See what collectivism can really do, because it is very powerful when you come together. And let's change the world of work. Let's challenge the balance of forces that exist in today's society. How much does it cost to join a union? Um, well, it's, it's different. Different unions um, offer different types of membership. Our union... Uh, the average is about £15 a month, uh, about £3.60 a week, uh, which in one way for some people might be seem you know, reasonably expensive, but in truth is you know, no more really than a pint of beer. And you, know, you can also, depends on whether you're a full-time worker, whether you're a part-time worker, um, and maybe we need to look at that. We need to look at the range of offers we, we mm. put forward for membership, uh, we're, we're looking at that in our own union. We've kept subscriptions. Uh, we've frozen them for a couple of years now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're up for looking at that debate. Well, we'll come on to some of the issues that you mentioned in just a moment. But um, do, do you, I mean, I, I have a 
viewpoint i mean ha- having been an employer i'm not an employer at the moment mm. but I've, I've run seven or eight companies all quite small companies and i've always taken the view that if you treat your employees badly they're not going to deliver the goods for you because they're not going to be motivated to do so and i think that's the view that most small and medium companies take but it does seem to me to be the larger companies that are the ones that think that they can exploit and, and I'm certainly not going to defend that. But yeah. I've, and I've seen it happen. M- many friends of mine have been, I think, exploited by these big companies. Um, what, though, can a trade union do about that kind of thing? I mean, we're not just talking about money here. We're talking no, about terms and conditions. You're, you're we're talking on. about holidays. We're talking about <coughs> the, the flexibility of working. Well, th- let's expose a few myths about work as we see it. So, you know, we recognise that part-time work is important we recognize that there's people out there um, who with their family commitments need to get the right balance between work and you know family commitments and there's a place undoubtedly for part-time working but I think what happens with every good idea that is meant to be positive towards workers um, there's a whole world of people who run companies big companies as you say but all companies in some ways who seek to exploit that for their own ends. So flexible working, for example. You know, everybody says it's great for the economy. But what does it really mean? And I've yet to see, you know, contracts, zero-hour contracts, you might call them, um, where it's truly flexible in a two-way street. Right. Well, we're g- so well, we well, could negotiate what a real flexible contract is, and we could make sure that that flexible contract still had holiday pay, still had sick pay. But let's continue on zero-hour contracts, because... Um, I know people who are on zero hours contracts who quite like them. Um, Students like them. Um, Often single mothers like them because they need the the Mm. flexibility. So when when they hear John McDonnell saying, well, we want to abolish them completely, and when they hear the Archbishop of Canterbury calling them the reincarnation of an ancient evil, I think quite a lot of people are switched off by that accepting the fact that for many people they they are effectively evil so I'm, I'm not i'm not trying to downplay that but there are a lot of people who quite like them aren't there i think there's probably a few people who may in their personal circumstances feel that that suits them and they're willing to do anything and and often people that are in that situation probably can afford to do that so they pop in and out students? of work mm. Well, no, I mean, like, they take whatever works on offer, don't they? But you can't base your economy on and work on a few people. You've got to look at the whole. And the reality is these contracts are not flexible. But only 2% for, for of people employed in this country are on zero hours contracts. Yeah, but I think there's, there's loads of other contracts. I don't know how familiar you are with. All you, all you hear in a company like Royal Mail even is like, it's not just zero-hour contracts. It's like contracts without holiday pay, contracts without sick pay, specific event contracts. And it's all about, there's always change coming. So we can't really employ anybody on a, on a full-time permanent contract. It's nonsense. You know, you, you, there's got to be a moment when we say in this country, this is a decent contract. Yeah. for work if you come into our company this is what you can I mean, expect the, the thing that i think a lot of people really uh take issue with is i was reading in my local paper in the um tunbridge wells courier this morning about a guy who'd been employed by sainsbury's in tunbridge for 30 years and they've suddenly decided to change all of their contracts so that instead of paying them eight pounds an hour they're going to pay them nine pounds 20 now which is well that's great mm. But then, of course, the small print, there's all sorts of yeah. other restrictions and um, other things. which they give it so in, in it, one end it, and yeah, take exactly. it away. And in the, the other, medium yeah. term, they're all going to be worse off. And you think, well, how can you treat somebody who's been a loyal employee for 30 years in this way? And that that's where some of these... And Sainsbury's, I think, most people think of as a good employer. You mm. think, well, if they're going down that road, you're onto something here, aren't you? I think we're definitely onto something in the sense of it's time for workers to have a new deal in the UK. And I really do believe that if we want to change society in the UK, if we want to, you know, make sure that we can get back to a place where, you know, people live on the whole a decent, you know, have a decent standard of living, your contract of employment, your pay, uh, what happens in the world of work is absolutely crucial. And if there's one thing that, that sticks out for me is the way that the Tories have led that debate over the years since Thatcher 
um, you know, flexible labour markets. I th- I New labour took it on. Lady Thatcher. It, was it Lady <laughs> Thatcher? Yeah. Okay. Um, Thatcher. But since you they carried it on New Labour, so I'm not just yeah. blaming the Tories. But, but since you mentioned her, look, you, you were you and I are roughly the same age, I think. So you will remember what happened in in the 70s and 80s with mm. regard to the way trade unions behaved. Do you not think the trade union movement brought those laws upon themselves in some ways? No, I, I don't think they brought them on themselves. I think Thatcher, Lady Thatcher, if you want to call her that, um, <laughs> was they thing? had an agenda. And their agenda was to crush the voice of working people. And the result of that has been the type of terms and conditions that you see across the UK at the moment, which I explained earlier on. Um, where I think trade unions should have been a bit more quicker to respond is, and personally I've never had a problem with this, is you know, jobs like mine, going up for election every few years the Tories shouldn't have brought that law in we should have brought that in so there was room for a change in the democracy of trade ballots and strikes rather than the mass meetings i mean you wouldn't go back to those days would you i'm a fan of both and i'm certainly a fan of workplace you can't be a fan of both sure how how can a mass meeting be democratic how can a mass meeting be democratic? Well, well you've got, you got, you got half story. the people putting both their hands up, I'll tell you up, a story you? about that once. Alan Layton, um, who used to be the chair uh, of, of the Royal Mail, we were in the middle of a dispute once. Actually, it was an unofficial dispute. And to his credit, he went down to where the dispute had started. He heard there was going to be a meeting where they were checking what was going on. And he turned up with a loud speaker in the middle of the uh, meeting and tried to convince them to go back to work in a mass meeting unfortunately they didn't they didn't sort of go with his position and they stayed out um so look well, it's not it, mass it's meetings part, no. object to it it's it's actually voting for strike action in a mass meeting well, which we, cannot we, be democratic but we've got strike ballots now mm. the debate about strike ballots is whether or not if you want more people to take part in them which is often the accusation that people are not um, participating yeah. in enough well then have it as a workplace ballot you know let's have a proper debate yeah. about these things um, but look I will say this you know our union smashed the anti-trade un- union laws because we engage with people so there is an onus on trade unions to also look at all ways to engage I think we should go to the calls don't let's you let's do that 0345 6060 973 Dave Ward is here General Secretary of the Communication Workers Union Brendan's in Nottingham what would you like to ask Brendan uh, basically, hello there, Ian, hello Hi. there, Dave. Um, there's pros and Hi, cons, Brendan. as in good and bad. First of all, uh, Dave, I used to be a union shop steward, general secretary. My job was to recruit members. Yeah. Now, before I actually joined, uh, our, uh, our union committee was very much dominated by Socialist Worker Party members. And when you say show of hands, what you used to do is that obviously they were encouraging you to strike. And they'd look at you, and they'd put hands up, and they'd look at you, and people would go, oh, like sheep, oh, my, I agree to strike, even though they're probably not going to go on strike because they felt as if intimidated into it. And I would put my hand up, those against, I'd put my hand up, and they'd look at me, and I'd push up even higher. And they realised eventually, I, I got a respect from them eventually, mm. as if I'm not going to be intimidated by you. So eventually, when I actually joined the committee, I then started encouraging people to join on the basis of, don't be afraid, you can have your say, I'm not going to let them bully you, etc., which I think is what uh, secret ballots allow people to do naturally. That's the first bit. Now, I got membership up to, ni- up to 91% of its potential, in that, yeah. and I know that sounds quite shocking, but that's a God's honest truth, and that was in the early 90s. Now, this is where, that's where, it's, you know, you've got yourself to blame. I think Ian's right there. Now, the, pl- the, the side where I, I feel you've been, well, we've all been basically poo-pooed on, excuse me, is basically uh, the uh, close shop. The reason, well, well, Brendan, we, we can't go through well, we can't go through every single trade union no, issue. No, 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 uh, no, have no, have no, you got no, a question no, that you no, want no, to put to Ian, Dave? Ian, Ian, just the one. The point I'm making is this: that if, for example, you've got people and there's the union uh, uh, negotiating a wage increase or better terms and conditions or better holiday pay or that, any, any, anything you want to think of, okay? Maybe a couple of days extra day annual leave or sick leave pay, etc. okay? Now, when they negotiate it, you get it whether you're a union member or not. Yeah. And that's the problem. That's the problem, unfortunately. So, effectively, a bit like people, for example, who have no intention of working and sponge off everyone else. It's the same people who are working for a living. 
There are a lot of people who are getting freebies. They're happy to, re- they're okay. happy to receive the benefits of what uh, union have negotiated. Brendan, by the way, you're right on the question of secret ballots. I, I'm not saying that they're wrong. I'm saying that you should also be able to have them in a workplace. Um, and we're not afraid of having a secret ballot. What's wrong is the Tory uh, laws that set thresholds that they don't apply to themselves as MPs. Most of them wouldn't even be elected if they applied the same it's, thresholds. Can you really compare the two things, though? I've, n- I've never thought can, that was yeah. the strongest argument yeah. no, that the I, trade I, look, unions have. But, but let, let me say, I'm not against secret ballots. Who, who's saying so that? What, what, I'm saying that you Labour, can have a secret ballot in a workplace. What has Labour promised to do if they come into power? Are they, are they going to change these rules? Yeah, Labour are going to repeal the anti-trade union laws, but they're going to put in its place some positive laws which are going to give a fair balance, really. You know, they're not rolling out the carpet for us to take over. We, we, we've got to sit there and we've got to make sure that we do our bit. And some of that is what Brendan said, actually. Secondary some picketing? Of, Secondary picketing, um, look, you know, the, the world's a real real world, Ian, and, you know, there's nothing with sol- wrong with solidarity, is there? I, I don't see a problem with that. Um, so you, you actually would like to see the law change to bring back or to allow secondary picketing, which was, I mean, I think that was part of the reason why Margaret Thatcher introduced all of those laws. Uh, uh, look, I, I think one of the problems today is that you're trying to sort of draw us into a debate here that we're going back to the 1970s, um, which we're not. My problem is, is the Tories are taking us back to the 1870s. Um, and I think it's about, you know, what are we going to do about the world of work? And they are the key debates that workers want to want to talk about. Um, and if I may say so, you know, I get a bit fed up with a debate on Brexit um, where everybody's getting angry or politicians are getting angry, the media are getting angry about what might happen Let's have a debate about what's happening today in the world of work, and more importantly, what we're going to do about it. Steve's in Thurrock. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ian. Hi, Mr Ward. Hi, Steve. Um, I I just wondered why, and it seems to be not necessarily yourselves, but other unions always seem to pick um, a day to go on strike when it's going to cause the absolute most inconvenience to the general public. Um, It doesn't matter whether you go on strike or not um, to the management or the government, they, they're they not going to give a, a, a hoot either way because they'll still go around in their private chauffeur, chauffeured cars and, and all that. But it always seems to affect the general public when it is at it, you know, when, at their most. Like it will always be during rush hour, for example. It will always be for 36 hours, which just conveniently happens to be during like a whole day's rush hour and and one rush out uh, um, either in the morning or the evening. Um, and it just absolutely baffles me. about. I, I don't understand what message you're trying to get other than we're just going to absolutely make sure that we um, frustrate as many people as we can. And I'm sure, Ian, has it been on the receiving end of a, a, a few of these action days. But um, if I can just jump in there, wouldn't you do the same thing? If if you were wanting to bring maximum leverage in a dispute, why, why would you do it in hours where it wouldn't mm, affect exactly. many people? But it, it, did it, I take the words it, out of your mouth there, Dave? Well, you did because, <laughs> because it's about maximum impact. Um, but look, let's start. But you're, let's but start. I'm not in a, I, but you're not in a negotiation with me, the general public. No, you're, in a negoti- uh, so you're let, supposed to be in a negotiation with. So the management. let's start. Let's start about industrial action and put it in the real world. Um, people don't start out by saying, do you know what, let's have a strike tomorrow. You know, it never starts like that. It's about trying to get to uh, the objective of reaching an agreement. And what I think the media manages to do is every time there's a dispute in the country, you, you and I've been on the end of this many times when you're being interviewed, you're in the wrong from the outset, really in the wrong as far as they see. And no one wants to listen to how unreasonable the employers have been throughout that. And many of the disputes that we've been involved in, you know, all right, so we've been involved in, you know, services, the public sector, stuff like that. You're actually defending the service. And at times, you know, there is no way out of that debate. If you've got an employer that's not willing to listen, um, actually it's the employer that doesn't give a damn about you as the customer often and that's our experience that's an honest experience but my take on strike action is is you know i'm not in this 
for the objective of having a strike. I'm in it for the objective of reaching an agreement and the best possible agreement for the members of our union. Uh, Steve, thank you. Uh, Andrew says, what an absolute pleasure to hear somebody on LBC who lives in the real world. That, well, thank you very much. Oh, no, is you don't mean, you don't you mean me. No, no. Dave Ward is a legend, says Andrew. I used to work at Royal Mail, but had to leave two years ago due to developing work-related depression and anxiety, all down to the lazy snakes they call managers. Well, we haven't got someone from the Royal Mail to reply to that, but... Uh, I think I know a few of them, actually. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> right, let's go to the next call. John is in Hayes. Hello, John. Hi, uh, is it... Can I speak to Dave? He was at the TUC last week. Uh, <laughs> I, re- so I recognise that voice. Course, yeah. <laughs> now, are he you going to... The TUC, so was I. Are you going <laughs> to ask him a very challenging question, John McDonnell? <laughs> oh, Dave was at the TUC and so was I, but I missed uh, Archbishop Welby's speech. So I want to know what Dave thought of it, because I thought it was fascinating, but the, the backlash in the media in the next few days was horrendous. But I thought he... The Archbishop actually stood very strong on that and made a lot of, a lot of relevant points. I just, Dave was in the audience. I wonder what he thought. Well, to be truthful, John, I was actually out getting a cup of coffee when he started <laughs> speaking. Um, but I did hear bits Part of time, it. Yeah. And, uh, John, I was a bit worried there for a minute. He was ringing in to phone up about your boss. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, look, he, he said, I think the fact that he's come out as strong as he has about what's happening in the world of work today is a wake-up call for all of us, for trade unions, for company bosses, um, for politicians. And, you know, John, you guys um, deserve a lot of credit because you've been in front of that debate for a long time. And I, I just wish that people in this country would understand how much change, serious change, that you're going to bring into this country when you get elected, and it will be when, um, because people need to hear these debates and, you know, to hear him saying this, um, I think there's a truth about what he said uh, and he's sending us a message, isn't he? He's saying to us, sort this out. John, can I ask you something on that speech? Because sure, um, sure. The, the Archbishop called uh, zero hours contracts the reincarnation of an ancient evil. And I think for a lot, of, a lot of people will have some sympathy with that. You want to ban zero hours contracts. But what about the people like students, single mothers, quite a few other groups who actually quite like them because it gives them the flexibility that they want? What would you do for those people? See, most of them want some form of guarantees, guaranteed hours. And that's what we'd make sure happened. And that would give an element of flexibility, but it would give people guaranteed hours. And that's, that's the point that Archbishop Welby made. When, when he stood up and spoke, I'd spoken the day before, and he made reference to it. And I, I said, actually, my dad and granddad were on the Liverpool docks, and they used to turn up for work, and they'd have to stand at the side of the road, and a gaffer would point to whoever was on the side of the road, and you'd be chosen mm, possibly definitely. for work that day. If not, you'd be sent home, you'd be wageless. Now, Archbishop Welby said that, that's what's so egregious that he actually identified that's come back with zero hours. And people just want an element of guaranteed hours so that at least they can plan their lives. That's the whole point. I have to say, in the debate at the TUC, I thought it was fascinating because the IPPR, of which the Archbishop, the um, policy think tank, that produced the report that the Archbishop was addressing had representatives right the way across industry, from trade unions to employers' organisations, religious groups, as the Archbishop was representing community groups. And it came to common conclusions. I, I welcomed the report, and I said, actually, I think it's like the sort of beverage report was for welfare. I think this is the report that will stimulate the debate about our economy, because I had lots of analysis but I've also lots of proposals not all that I agree with but it does start that debate off and it did demonstrate a real insecurity that there is at work at the moment for so many people uh, and do you think that I mean we don't know when the next election is going to be obviously but whenever it comes do you think the world of work uh, and the, the kind of new deal that David's been talking about is that going to be one of the key election platforms key. for you uh, look, look, Ian, I think it's key you, you have people phoning in all the time I think it's absolutely key. People have never felt so insecure like they do at the, today. And uh, the figure that really struck me that's come out of all the debate, we've got four million children in our country living in poverty. Yeah, and someone is in their household is in work. So that shows you that wages are so low. Wages are still below 
2010 level. So no wonder people are struggling, and no wonder household debt is so high at the moment. So yes, I think it will be a key issue. John, can I ask you a question here? Um, I mean, w- one of the things that winds me up is when I hear experts, so-called experts about the world of work, politicians, mostly Tory politicians, some of our old uh, New Labour people, you know, when they talk about unemployment, I think they're missing the point here. What we've got today, and there's no other way of saying this, is far too much crap employment. And we need to start changing the quality of jobs and raise the level of this debate and get back to proper contracts of employment. And, you know, I know you guys um, are on to this. I know you understand, you know, how, how important this is. But, you know, my plea would be let's have a proper debate in Britain about the world of work. Let's make it the number one This, this isn't issue. a very yeah. challenging question for John, if I no, may say so, Dave. Not, no, but, um, <laughs> the, the, question is diff- the question is difficult for us in this sense. I go into the House of Commons chamber and the Conservatives jump up and down and say, you know, we've created this number of million jobs extra, etc. Of course you say, yeah, I welcome the employment. Yeah. But the problem is this. A lot of that is insecure work, low paid, and actually as well, it's quite oppressive. So we now have a mental health crisis at work at the moment as well. So we've got to have an honest debate about the nature of the work that, yeah. that we need in this country, the sort of education and training and skills that we need for the high paid jobs because they come with the high skills. In that way, we need that honest debate so we can go forward. And do you know what was interesting from the IPPR report, that um, the think tank report that Archbishop Welby was uh, referring to and was part of, is that he'd be able to construct a consensus between trade unions and employers about the way forward. And I think government needs to wake up to that. Now, John, um, you've successfully hijacked Dave's hour <laughs> for a few minutes. Um, very well done for that. I couldn't help. I couldn't help. We'll, we'll be giving him a secure <laughs> job soon in number 11 well, Downing I, Street well, I, as well. I, I was, I'm, I'm going to invite him again to come and do the same as you, to come in with me for an hour and take calls from listeners. And um, we'd love you to do yeah. that, John. Ian, I promise you that before and I'll let you down. I'm sorry about that. I will do and I'll find time and I'll definitely do it. Any Tuesday evening at 8, we're there all you yours. Thank you, John, thank you very much John. indeed for calling in. That's John McDonald there, the Shadow Chancellor. Well, that was interesting, it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, he, John McDonald, I think, is a very interesting character in politics. He's been around, what, in Parliament since 1992. Yep. Um, has always been seen as sort of on the, in inverted commas, far left of the Labour Party, but he's a very good communicator, isn't he? Well, he's more than a very good communicator. He's very understanding of the problems in this country, and he's putting forward real solutions for millions and millions of people in this country who have been left abandoned. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I get the opportunity sometimes to compare Uh, you know how Labour are now when they talk about some of their issues and they may ask you a view on certain things to what it used to be like and these people you know believe me on this they've got joined up thinking they've got joined up policies and when they say it's for the many not the few they mean it. Uh, We've got lots of calls coming in we'll come back to those in just a second two very contrasting tweets here um jackie says she sent a a tweet to radio 4 she says i'm listening to lbc because they have (laughs) dave ward on and they're discussing trade unions and why don't you take a leaf out of their book and give trade unions a voice unfortunately uh jimmy rather disagrees lbc every time i turn you on you have left-wing nutters espousing their (laughs) nonsense sometimes presenters this evening the dangerous labor party they will ruin this country again let's hope people wake up before it's too late so you can't please everyone but then you know you never will will you i wonder what his solution is then take us back to the 1670s rather than the 1870s that the tories are taking us back to uh, tracy is in north shropshire what would you like to ask tracy oh hi in first time caller welcome Thank you. Um, I've got a, it's not very highbrow, but I've just got a very simple question. As someone who recently ventured into the world of getting a trade union and then subsequently left, why do you have to be assumed to be left-leaning to have your workers' rights protected? Well, I don't think you do, Tracy. I think it applies to all workers. Um, the, the situation with workers today, um, we stand for all workers. You know, I'm not a believer that you have to belong to a certain political party or have left-leaning views. You know, if you're okay, in the well, world that, that of work... that doesn't come across, though. That doesn't come across when you're trying to join the union. It doesn't come across whilst mm. you're in the union. Um, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting emails from the um, shop steward saying, labelling it comrade. 
things like that. Um, when you're going on the websites, I had to fight for ages to find one that wasn't trying to trick me into joining the Labour Party and making part of my contribution. I just think that you, the, the question tonight is about trade unions, and yeah. this is a lay person. I think you, it, sometimes you need to think about the person and not about their political belief. And no, uh, and I think you're saying no, that's I'm a, how no, it's come I'm, across to me. I'm agreeing with you because actually I believe that trade unions have an independent role um, from politicians. And, you know, our, our view is is we don't wait for politicians to change things. We have to do it ourselves. That's why we're trade unions. Why do we uh, support the Labour Party? Well, I've got to be honest with you, a few years back, um, I was getting very close to saying to people in our union, I don't know why we're supporting the Labour Party, um, because they'd walked away from working people. Um, but, but there is a reality, to be Tracy. Labor to be working? No, of course you don't. Of course you don't. No, nobody's saying that. But there's. You just did. Well, no, I didn't just say that. I said. You said you didn't believe in labour in labour because they weren't supporting the working person. You're saying that only one party supports the working person. But they brought. Yeah, but that's in my view that is true. My my view is is that the situation with working people in this country is that the only party that really represents their views uh, is the current Labour Party, okay, not the well previous Labour Party. All unions, so that's your personal belief that all unions are coming across with that message and that I think you're missing a whole group of people and that as a personal person who's never voted Labour in her life, I don't feel supported by any trade union and I think you're missing a trick because it doesn't mean I'm not a working person. Uh, and I agree with you on that point. I'm not saying you have to agree with Labour to become a trade union member. Our, our priority must be to protect your terms and conditions, fight for your terms and conditions, irrespective of your political leanings. I, I seem to remember in 1979 that 40% um, of trade unions actually voted Conservative in that election. I don't know what the percentage is now, but... I mean, it's, well, it, they'll always vote different ways politically, yeah. um, but I think the majority of people will always understand the need to stand up for working people. That's the bottom line. Um, Alan in Liverpool. Thank you very much, Tracy. By the way, Alan in Liverpool has got an interesting question. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, good, good, good evening. Oh, hi, Dave. Don hi, Alan. Jones, uh, I am a Wellington Mail Centre um, political officer, but I'm not falling as the political officer of the branch, as I'm falling as an individual. Yeah. And I was, um, I was listening to the TUC, and they understand, I understand that you are not calling for a people's vote on the agreement, unlike the TUC. My point is, how can we as a union not agree with the TUC and what the benefits or the bad deal would, would be, unlike when we were at, when, in the union, we went to great pains to the length and breadth of the country, telling the members of, of, of what the deal deal was of our four pillar uh, agreements. So we explained it in detail. Yeah. And it's like, it's like uh, you know, you, you need to be informed to make an informed decision. I personally, and I know you don't, trust the Labour Party with last week's Liverpool Echo, and I was just wondering why you're not calling for a people's vote. Well, let's ask him. <laughs> well, the reason that I'm not calling for a people's vote is because I think we need a people's government. And, you know, I, I do struggle, I'm being totally honest with you guys now, about where we are with Brexit. Um, and I may have a slightly different view, although I have to say the view that we agreed as a general council on the TUC was exactly the view... Uh, that I put forward at the rostrum. Um, I think there are people within the TUC who will have different views on this, and I totally accept that for some workers, a no-deal Brexit is the end of their jobs, and that can't be allowed to happen, and we need to deal with that. But look, here's my point, is that when I hear politicians and you know some people in business, some people in their own movement, you know, sometimes shouting the odds about what might happen in Brexit. I want to hear them talking more about what's happening now with workers' rights in the UK. And I think that you've got to get it that way round. You've got to look at Brexit within that context. And I honestly believe this, yeah? Two things that are going to make the biggest difference to our members' lives, um, to workers around the country, to my families, to the listeners' families, in my view is a transformative Labour government getting elected um, and us as a movement, a trade union movement, coming together and fighting for a new deal for workers, a bold new deal where workers really do uh, get a better deal right across the UK. 
Alan, thank you for your call. A um, couple of questions are on Labour at the moment. Um, do, do you think the Labour Party conference is going to vote or should vote for mandatory reselections? Um, I, I think that I kind of look at it from this point of view that I have to stand for election. Um, so there is a question of accountability, and one view would be, and there's some truth in this, is that you know what you've got to hide from people if the people that are members of the party um, want to hold their particular candidate um, MP to account on occasions. There's another view, I think, that says that, well, you know, maybe there's some thresholds you have to meet before you get to that point. Um, the Labour Party, you know, we'll have a look at the proposals. We haven't made our mind up on it at this point in time, and we'll have a debate on it. Now, John McDonnell has said he hopes Labour's next leader will be female. Do you think the Labour Party will be led by a woman any time soon? Who, who would you tip for the top? <laughs> um, that's, that's really difficult. I think, yes, Labour will be led by a woman um, in the very near future. Um, no, I shouldn't say the very near future. Jeremy's our leader. He'll be the Prime Minister. Um, but, but there will but you, be a Do you think a, a woman should follow him? I think on balance, yes. I think there's very many talented women in the Labour Party Emily at the moment. Emily Thornbury? Angela um, Rayner? Yeah, a Emily Thornbury. Uh, Angela Rayner, I think for me, is a bit more down to earth. Um, Rebecca Long Bailey. Uh, there's lots of women MPs in the Labour Party who are very good. Um, so, you know, I'm not ruling anybody out at this stage or ruling anybody in. Well, let's talk to another talented woman. Christine is in Chester. Christine, what would you like to ask? Yes, I'd like to ask, what's really the Brexit vote to, to undermine workers' rights and to sell our NHS to privatisation? Well, I, I think what you're, you're asking, Christine, is, is more around the reality of Europe. And uh, I voted Remain personally. Our union recommended Remain. I would still vote Remain, um, but I'm not a fan of a second referendum. And I, I'm a believer that you've got to reform Europe. And one of the things you've got to do in Europe is change the democracy of Europe. I think there are too many people who have failed politicians in this country um, who suddenly find themselves in jobs in, in Europe. And I want to hear what new ideas they've got. I want to see a social Europe. I want to see Europe that actually does stand up for workers, not like we saw in Greece, um, where, you know, they, they sort of really went for the, for the Greek nation, um, didn't show a lot of empathy towards their situation, and it was more about the finances and the financial institutions. So Europe's not a panacea, and I do believe that some of the problems with Europe is that it does end up liberalisation. Let me, let me tell you about the postal service. Um, you know, we got liberalised, and what that basically meant was, was that any company could come in, choose when they delivered mail, what they delivered, and how they delivered it. We had to supply a universal service that the public wanted and needed, and they could come in and undercut, you know, our members' wages with low terms and conditions. And to some extent... The undercutting of pay has happened as a result of what Europe have pushed. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure having you in the studio for an hour. I know it's gone by a lot quicker than yeah, you thought it was quick, going yeah. to, but um, that's the joys of live radio. Um, Dave Ward, I hope we'll have you back very soon because I yeah, think that, we've yeah. had loads yeah. and loads of calls. And I do, I agree with what you said right at the beginning that I think. All sorts of media don't actually maybe give trade union leaders as much time as they should. So I hope we've done a done a bit of a service. Yeah, no, I appreciate the, judging the by opportunity. The, judging by the tweets and texts that I've been getting all through the hour, I think most people, with the odd exception, most people <laughs> have actually enjoyed hearing what you've got to say. So thank you very much right. indeed. Thanks.